All right. Okay. Um, why don't we start? Because we don't have a lot of time. Um, so, well, you already heard from me. Um, I'm Valentina Di Francesco. I'm also going to be one of the moderators for this session together with uh, Dr. Adam Resnick. Uh, Adam? Hi, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, you know, I'm at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and have a privilege of serving on the external uh, council in ways that you know, have just been really fruitful and uh, looking forward to this discussion. So I, I just have um, two or three slides to, to show just to lay down some ground rules for these discussions. Um, okay, do you see my slides? Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, let me see if I manage to project the whole screen. Okay. All right, so um, to summarize what's gonna happen during the breakout session, um, we, we have, we're going to go through this presentation, two or three slides, then we'll hear a presentation from Brian O'Connor at the Broad and Fred Tan at the Carnegie Institution. Um, it will be followed, we'll have uh, up to 45 minutes for discussions. Um, and then we will, uh, in the meantime, while the discussion happens, um, uh, Adam will moderate the discussion while I'm going to take notes uh, for the SWOT analysis. And so uh, those notes will be used uh, at the end of the session to prepare the breakout report that Adam will present at the end of this uh, session. So uh, just some general guidelines about um, for the discussion. Uh, the participants are going to be muted. Uh, and uh, as you heard, there are people here that have been selected as discussants. Um, and, and so we'll basically going to ask you to speak up and to express your opinions and thoughts uh, uh, for, and you know, in the context of strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats. Um, for the other participants, um, if you can, please um, wait uh, until we, we, there is time uh, for you to share comments and opinions. Um, you can also do that uh, either on the chat, but we actually would prefer for you to use um, a document that is available on the shared Google Drive. Uh, please navigate there, navigate to the relevant subfolder for our breakout room session and, and just feel free to add your comments there. Uh, as I said, we're going to collect everything and, uh, and then address them uh, when, when we can. So, so please, uh, when, if you use the document, please just write your name uh, before you share the comments. So uh, the other thing is, um, again, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time, but um, if you speak up, please be, be, be candid, be heard, be polite, you know, usual recommendations, and make sure that you give time for other people to express their thoughts. Um, and if you have any concerns whatsoever about what is happening during the discussion, feel free to reach out to me or to other NGRI staff, um, and uh, we'll try to help. Okay, so for this particular breakout room, uh, the discussants, the names of the discussants are, are here. And um, last thing is that because we have only 45 minutes uh, and we have four topics to go through, uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, it's about 10 minutes each. So we will try to keep everybody on time. And when the 10 minutes are up for a particular topic, we'll, uh, We'll move on to the next one. Uh, and just a reminder that uh, there are some particular team themes that we would like to learn more about, and that is the use of the cloud, uh, what is needed for cloud-based systems to better meet the needs of the genomic research community, uh, whether there are tools and services that will better support clinical genomics research, and then the other uh, theme is about interoperability, what is needed to improve interoperability with other genomic resources in the federated uh, ecosystem. So I think that basically is all I have to say. Um, and Valentina? I think, yes. Can I just ask you a quick, I just want a clarification. For sure. clinical genomics, I think of CLIA, but you're saying research, correct? I just want to make sure I'm clear. Yeah, it's, the... it's, it's research. Perfect, thank it's you. research. It may go into CLIA, but it's really at this point where we're thinking of research. All right. 
Okay. So, Adam, do you have um, the name of the names of the discussants handy, or okay. do you need me? It's going to be Brian. Uh, I think we'll start. Yes. Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay, great. Okay. Can folks see my screen? Perfect. All yes. right. Let me try and do slideshow. Hold on. All right. Hopefully that's continuing to share my screen. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, all right. So thanks for that intro, Valentina. Um, today, um, uh, Fred and I are going to talk about the sort of data submission and consortium engagement uh, for Anvil. I'm really excited to talk about this. Um, I'm going to talk mainly about, and of course my slides aren't advancing. All right, I'm going to mainly talk about the submission system, the progress that we've made getting data into Anvil, and where are we going in the future uh, with this. Uh, I'm then largely going to hand it over to Fred. I'm going to touch on consortium engagement with regards to um, submission of data, and Fred is going to dive into uh, using um, consortium engagement to prompt analysis of data in the Anvil platform, as well as overall sort of future directions for engagement. Um, so starting with data submission, just taking a step back, I'm sure everyone on the call is very familiar with the dbGaP model. I just wanted to compare a little bit with uh, dbGaP with Anvil and just kind of clarify how we're, we're actually still leveraging some parts of dbGaP in the Anvil process. But broad brush strokes here in dbGaP, one goes in and creates a study and goes through a data onboarding process um, for phenotypic and genotypic data into dbGaP, into SRA, and goes through in a sort of approval process and validation process. In Anvil, um, it's different. We're not actually submitting uh, data to SRA, for example. We're actually storing it directly in the cloud environment, directly in Anvil. Um, we still go through a process of approving um, uh, which projects are going into Anvil and also registering studies within dbGaP as a way of having a centralized authorization uh, location, which is very, very convenient uh, for us and other projects. Um, but the phenotypic data is being input into integrated tables within Anvil workspaces, and genomic files are being directly onboarded in the cloud. And the, the really lovely, wonderful side effect, and you're going to see this as Fred talks about the analysis being done uh, with consortia and, and other groups, um, is this is information that's ready to go for analysis within the uh, Anvil uh, workspace environment powered by Terra. Okay, so let's take a look a little bit at the sort of data life cycle of data coming into Anvil. Um, there are four personas, I would say. There's the overall sort of data collectors that are aggregating data for a given consortia and preparing it. There's the data submitters that are actually transforming data model information into something that Anvil understands, preparing the submission, preparing those phenotypic tables, um, and uh, submitting uh, 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 genotypic information large files to buckets and going through a review process. And notice that this can be a cycle, right? There can be multiple rounds of review before data is handed off to the data uh, ingesters. This is AKA also sort of data wranglers. This is Candace and Valerie on the Broad team that are working very closely with these data submitters to get the data onboarded into uh, final workspaces in Anvil and accessible uh, through a release process. And then finally, data analysts can use that through workspaces or create synthetic cohorts for use in their own workspaces within, within the Anvil platform. One thing I want to point out here is the arrows going back, I think, are really important. And we've seen that with CCDG uh, doing a sort of joint calling on, I think it's about 140,000 genomes. The idea here is that uh, when we perform analysis within Anvil, that can actually shuttle information back into a new submission process. So there's this virtuous cycle of being able to um, use Anvil for not only data submission, but also um, uh, data analysis and resubmission. Um, so what does the submission checklist look like effectively? Uh, it starts with the, obtaining approval for this particular data set or consortia to um, upload data to the Anvil, uh, developing a data model. We're moving away from the model of every consortia having its own um, uh, data model to one where we have common elements. And you saw that in the discussion and the pre-read on the Terra interoperability model. Uh, we work with them to prepare the data uh, in the appropriate formats for upload um, uh, to cloud buckets uh, and tables in workspaces. 
and then run the Anvil data ingest uh, process. Uh, so prerequisite uh, steps for consortia bringing their data into Anvil, uh, we have the study registration process in dbGaP to define that sort of authorization information and then mapping to the Anvil model and ultimately making decisions about how data is parsed into workspaces on consent group or per group per consent group. Um, okay, so with that being said, kind of giving you the overview of how the flow works, uh, I wanted to take a step back and look at the overall sort of uh, uh, one-year plan for data ingest. I, I think what's remarkable here is we currently have over 20 consortia engaged with Anvil to bring their data into the platform, which is you know, absolutely amazing. Um, we're seeing continued data submission from established consortia. This is a, 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 a timeline looking out into the future here. Uh, but we're also seeing new opportunities with ENCODE data, developmental GTEx data, NIA's um, dementia long reads data set, uh, things like recount three for bringing in RNA-seq data. So there's a lot of diversity and excitement about new consortia uh, engaging with Anvil and bringing in new data types. Uh, into the platform. Um, I, 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 it's lovely to see this uh, posted on our website. This really kind of brings it home in terms of how much data is in the system now. Uh, we're getting very close to 300,000 participants being loaded into the Anvil uh, platform. And if you look at the data growth over time, um, you know we've gone essentially from one petabyte of data about a year ago um, to almost four petabytes of data. And so that's really, really exciting to see that, that increase happening, even though we're still working through the process of how do we reduce the manual steps and, and, and have more and more automation. It's wonderful to see that. It's also wonderful to see how Anvil's data growth here has really positively impacted things like cross NIH um, efforts like NCPI, which is looking at making data widely available across systems. You can see Anvil has had a huge impact over the last year on the amount of data that's accessible NCPI wide, including systems like um, uh, Biodata Catalyst, uh, GDC, Kids First, and Anvil, making approximately 11 petabytes as of a couple of weeks ago, accessible to researchers that are working in the Anvil platform. They can work with data across all of these data sets, including the Anvil data. So it's just really awesome to see that. Again, we're really trying to focus on how do we automate as much as possible. And you know, we've made a huge amount of progress in terms of data ingest, but we want to continue to make that process smoother and more automated and faster. And so we've recently been working on improvements to that process. We've developed scripts that will help us set up uh, uh, submission workspaces for uh, consortia to come in and prepare um, their submissions. We've provided templates and we've provided a self-running uh, QC, uh, a submission checking tool that allows them to do a lot of the work on their, on their own, where previously it was a combination of their work and also working with data wranglers to check data and do validations. So the scripting that we've done has actually paid off quite a bit already in terms of uh, streamlining the way that, that researchers can upload their data as part of these consortia and validate the data themselves. Um, in terms of focusing on, on improvements, again, Part of it is tooling, uh, the scripting infrastructure that I mentioned, but also it's, it's simple things like refining our data uh, submitter instructions on the Anvil uh, uh, project.org website and refining sort of you know, the critical path that researchers uh, and data submitters go through for ingesting data into Anvil. So really a part of the consortia engagement here is really getting that feedback on this process and bringing those um, improvements to the documentation. The other thing I will say too is in addition to the sort of scripted improvements and automation that we have already rolled out, we're working on um, a more fundamental submission system uh, improvement over the next year plus that will bring a lot of benefits, including the ability to sort of automatically map um, a, a data models from submitters to um, a common Anvil data, data model based on TIM. Um, and also using that common data model for automated validations. Instead of having uh, a notebook like we do right now that does validation of a submission, we want that to be schema driven. We want that to be driven by the data model. So as we update our data model, the validation suite um, can be updated as well. Um, all right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about consortia engagement from a submission perspective before handing over to Fred to talk more about it from the perspective of using the platform. 
Um, regardless, we have really sort of four pillars of uh, consortia engagement. First is you know, building awareness of, of Anvil and, and what the platform does and how consortia can engage with us. And the second pillar here is looking at recruitment. How do we reach out um, and recruit new data sets and go through the approval process and work uh, with the submitters in that? Um, that ulti ultimately leads to the third pillar of submission and the fourth pillar of then using that submitted data um, in analysis within working groups and, and uh, research consortia um, beyond uh, the submission process. So how do we think about consortia engagement? Um, we're looking at it from the perspective of developing uh, personas, and we have sort of four uh, core personas, the PI, analysts, teachers, and consortia. And that last consortia um, persona, you know, we've really, from a submission perspective, focused in on data managers and submitters as the key persona subtypes within consortia. And if you look on the sort of online documentation that we have that goes with our submission system, we've really tried to use those personas um, to craft in, you know, high quality instructions about dbGaP um, uh, uh, study creation, how to work with our data model, how to actually do the submission and how to actually run QC tools on the submission itself and the, the data uh, QC uh, tooling that we provide as well. So with that, I, I, I just wanna say um, that work, that personas work and the feedback that we've gotten from projects like CCDG and CMG and GTEx and Thousand Genomes, which have been a core part of our you know, success story for onboarding data over the last year, um, this work together with these, these projects, these consortia has been very instrumental in refining that engagement process, refining those paths that we give people to onboard data and the documentation and tooling that goes with that. Um, that's led to things like the uh, telomere to telomere project that Mike was mentioning earlier, um, being able to onboard data into Anvil, um, their reference uh, genome along with um, uh, sample data from Thousand Genomes and others that go with that. So we've been able to streamline the up, uh, upload and submission process. And that ultimately has, trans has transitioned into how then people are able to use, uh, in this case, telomere, to telomere data in a, in a very lovely uh, featured workspace that shows how you can actually leverage uh, this uh, data uploaded to Anvil. So with that, I wanna kind of transition over to Fred to talk through that consortium level engagement that leads to analysis opportunities. Um, Fred? Thank you, Brian. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> And so one of the great things about um, engaging the consortia is that not only are they able to contribute their data, but they're able to um, use the data sets that are already existing. And so showing here is just an example of the TDT consortium reanalyzing the 3,000 uh, uh, genomes from the 1,000 Genome Project. And uh, one of the benefits of this um, shared ecosystem is that all of their analysis, the, the whittles, the workflows that they're developing are now accessible and reusable and extendable by anyone else who wants to do a similar kind of analysis. Uh, next slide. Clinical uh, genomics is something that's on everyone's mind. And so some of the consortia that we're engaged with uh, in addition to the American Heart Association and eMERGE are uh, social determinants of health. And one of the great things about engaging with uh, AHA is that they've been conducting focus groups with clinicians that have genomics experience, finding out exactly what kind of tools they need. And so one of the premises that, you know, um, Brian did get a chance to touch on is the fact that, you know, the more a system is used, the better it becomes for everyone involved. And so finding out exactly what are the highest priority tools led to the incorporation of FarmCat, which is coming soon. Um, one of the most uh, requested tools that helps um, clinicians interpret variant alleles and suggest clinical dosing guidelines. Uh, next slide. So some of the activities that we've been using uh, to, to, to increase awareness and help recruit people to the platform, um, we've been uh, working on over the past uh, couple of years now that the system is coming online. And uh, if you go to the next slide, um, the first one that um, I, I think some of you were uh, even uh, attended at was the NHGRI um, uh, uh, GSP Magic Jamboree. This happened last summer, and uh, there were over 100 attendees and it was a two day virtual hands-on event where people got to do activities using the platform itself. And one of the great things was seeing the feedback of people telling us that you know, they loved what the platform um, uh, already has available, where it's going, and uh, the kind of activities that we're uh, creating for um, people to use. Uh, next slide. 
um, talking about Vince's, you know, Vince is trying to uh, increase the size of the tent. Um, another group that we've worked with is uh, RCMI um, uh, this past spring to try and bring uh, Anvil and data science cloud uh, genomics uh, to broader audiences. So specifically institutions that have uh, less resources um, than others. Next slide. And then finally, the Genomic Data Science Community Network, where we're intentionally targeting institutions uh, across the country, um, HBCUs, uh, tribal colleges, uh, minority-serving institutions, and community colleges. And one of the great things about this activity is building up the network of uh, researchers, uh, creating a white paper that touches on the, the, the exact needs that these institutions need, and developing curricula so that we can start incorporating ANVIL into the curriculum so we can get people early on in their training to start um, getting the skills that they need to take advantage of these great resources. Next slide. And so um, the two last slides morning. here. Uh, one is that all the consortia are now invited to the four working groups here that have stars next to them. So for increased opportunity, increased questions, increased awareness, they're able to come here um, and ask us direct questions. And I think this is one of the great ways to help um, bring people to, to, to really understand what the platform is. And the last slide. And so our vision for our future engagement is to continue this marketing funnel, this community acquisition funnel, where we're um, trying to raise awareness, evaluation, intent, conversion, and ultimately loyalty so that the community themselves are able to support each other. And that I think is going to be our uh, biggest hallmark when people are able to start interacting with one another, supporting each other and recruiting um, um, each other to our platform. And so just want to thank you on behalf of Brian and myself for the, the privilege of being able to work on such a great uh, uh, platform, um, um, bringing access uh, to people in this community. Thank you. Thanks, guys. That was really awesome. Uh, so it's my privilege to try uh, and uh, engage all of you in a SWOT analysis. And uh, despite, I think, the, the traditional context of SWOT being, you know, an implementation on behalf of a competitive activity uh, uh, for most uh, market-based efforts, you know, this is really a forward-looking strategy. Um, and I want to just provide a framing that it'd be great to start with, which is, in the context of consortia, um, there are a couple of different ways uh, in, in data submission, a couple of different ways to frame the opportunities, uh, strengths, weaknesses, and, and threats for, for this. One is what are, the, what are these in relationship to the consortia and what are these in relationship to the consortia's data uh, and the secondary use and its empowerment. Um, the narrative for the, for the latter is oftentimes better developed than the former. Um, and I just want to frame that as an opportunity to begin um, you know, really thinking about this framework. And I think you know, for, in order to really uh, a structure the discussion, we can start with the, the strength setting, which I think Brian um, uh, and Fred already covered to some extent, beginning with, for example, ease of submission of data, um, the capacity to intersect that data with existing data sets. Um, but I'd like to push a little bit on, on that setting and and get some input from that perspective, particularly as it relates to at least what we've experienced, the consortia's life cycle as connected to the data life cycle in where platforms like Admin can begin. So maybe you'd start with the strengths. And I think we have about essentially 10 minutes to try and cover the strengths perspective uh, here. I would say um, Anvil can replace uh, a lot of data coordination functionality within consortia, make it more economical for reuse of the infrastructure. This is a key opportunity. Uh, and uh, currently, right, um, most consortia already have some existing DCC uh, or other activity that's already incorporated, typically separate from a platform setting with many data sets within the Anvil to date, really being provided at the, at, at the last stage of the data life cycle, post a consortia's own activities and the data on behalf of secondary use and distribution. The, the telomere to telomere example is a, you know, a really great example of the consortia itself leveraging the platform, not only for the secondary use and distribution, but for that, what the cloud and the Anvil platform actually drives as a use case in ways that typically are not existent within the DCC's framework. I think it's a great example of a, of a strength. 
And just to add a little bit of color, you know, it's as uh, Ken Valentina said at the beginning, the anvil is about three years old. And when we first started, there were a large number of consortia that were already underway. And so, you know, it really was a model where we had to kind of focus on getting stuff that already existed into the anvil. But what's quite exciting to see is that if you look at a lot of the awards that have been given in the last year, whether it be the new wave of Mendelian uh, awards or the Telemer to Telemer or the Prime Consortium or Emerge 4, those are all ones that are getting going after the existence of the Anvil. And so the model which, by which we're engaging with them is exactly what you saw in Telemere to Telemere. So we very much hope that that will be the dominant model going forward. David? Yeah, Anthony's already talked about uh, the, the strength of this, but I, I do think you know, managing uh, the individuals with the data sets based on consent level downstream is going to be super helpful. I mean, I've sort of been around when people have downloaded and all you can do is just send an email saying these individuals should not be used in analysis. So I, I do think post-study management uh, is definitely a strength. You know, thank you very much for that, David. Maybe um, there were a few questions about duos during the talk. You'll hear more about that in the second session today, but David alluded to it. So let me just clarify a little bit is one of the things that the future of the Anvil holds is that we ingest these data sets, we collect the data use restrictions, and we model them using a formal ontology. Uh, it's quite nice. There's a paper that's going to be coming out in cell genomics in about a week showing that empirically this works very well. Uh, and what that means is right now, if you are a researcher and you say, I'm studying diabetes, tell me all the samples that I can use as a control. Uh, that is, you know, weeks of project management time in order to be able to answer that question. Whereas, you know, where Anvil is going, it's a simple SQL query, and it also simplifies a lot of the data, the um, the DB gap work of reviewing the, the applications. So right now, we're so to switch all of the way that you, you change data access is a big lift, right? That's a big, big challenge. But we're quite far along, and you'll hear more about it today. Where there's now a large scale pilot of Duos by six NIH DACs. Uh, and if that uh, works well, then we'll start to really scale up and automate a lot of the, act, the framework of data use oversight. So you'll hear more about it later today, but I just wanted to clarify because I saw quite a few questions uh, during the chat. You know, and the data use is really, you know, uh, it's interesting that, that you bring it up, uh, Anthony, right? Because most consortia, in some respects, initially, at least by our experience, have the, the notion that they are the body of governance, at least until submission for secondary um, uh, use and discovery. Um, and I think that's, again, you know, one of those shifts in opportunity that um, you know, is arriving that most consortia are still challenged in the distribution and access of their data pre-release, for example, or pre-becoming um, a data set for wider secondary use. Um, that activity oftentimes is slow and challenging for the DCC itself to manage beyond it, the, the primary stakeholders of consortia. Elizabeth? Hi, um, just in terms of strengths, I can imagine once, um, once you're used to having your data in this environment and you've got your toolkit set up and your pipelines and your whatever, this is going to make it a lot easier to train students to get them up to speed quickly. So just reflecting on the the need to diversify our workforce, this makes it some, so you can have somebody do like a rotation in your lab and do something meaningful um, once it's all pulled together. Right now it's a little bit cobbled, but I can see that being a real advantage to the space in the future. Yeah, I love Anthony's uh, sports of, sport of Kings sort of analogy here. This is clearly you know, a main opportunity for uh, these efforts. Uh, and again, in the context of consortia, um, consortia themselves are oftentimes academic discovery focused efforts. Um, less data generation, data sharing efforts, um, and the capacity to support the consortia's own scientific initiatives in the context of training and widening that out uh, really is a fantastic, I think, uh, resource opportunity where, where essentially the data generators themselves know the data extremely well, but can use it as a training platform within their own um, stakeholder community. 100%. Yeah, really, sorry, really quick. I don't want to take too much time. The other oh. thing I would comment on is you all are putting together all these great workshops and so on. That's another way that you can get people very quickly engaged, even if they're not a trainee who's going to be joining your program. So it will be great to see how that stuff gets integrated. Right. And just related to this point, one of the things I put in the notes was the 
diversity action plan training programs at NHGRI are really ideal opportunity for mentored experience with Anvil as part of that whole outreach uh, and diversity and workforce uh, training. I, I think those could be integrated really, really nicely. You know, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to change topic slightly. So if you were responding directly to Carol. Nope. Okay. So first of all, Carol, I agree. And I think we've been thinking about some of that integration with our training pro, um, training program. And sure, Joe Sen has certainly been very active in that. And that's a really good suggestion. I was going to throw the group out, at, throw the question out to the group. I think particularly Liz and Steve Rich, I'd be interested from hearing from you. Part of our hope is as a strength of the anvil is that by bringing a lot of this data from different programs together, it has the, the potential to help people connect across consortium or be more aware of, even more aware of what data is out there and what's there. And I guess my question to you is, does that seem true? Is that, a, you know, do, would you agree that's a strength? Do you think we're not there yet? Do you, or do you worry that that is you know something that I'd be hoping would be happening that isn't, and I guess I'd ask Liz and Steve Rich first, and then others can also comment. Go ahead, Liz. All right, I I guess I'm a little odd. I work on Alzheimer's disease, and I work on rare disease. Yeah. So the NIA is not well integrated into this. So for me, this is awesome because I'd love to connect to things like eMERGE really easily where you may have people who have dementia and maybe I can't call them Alzheimer's disease, but I can get something that is kind of mimicking replication that way. That would be fantastic. So I, I think that that's something that in the future could be developed, but for me, that's kind of a no-go. They're siloed still. Um, and for the rare disease stuff, um, I, I feel like we, the phenotyping categorization is really tricky you know, because I can't just say, give me all the patients who have rare disease because maybe somebody has been misdiagnosed or maybe there's phenotype expansion. So then I want to do things like search on features, which I don't see that being very easy right now. And I, I think in order to build an analysis set that is taking data from multiple resources, we really need to have a tool, which I think is being developed. And I got a, what is a notice of interest this morning. Um, on it, but some sort of like natural language processing or something that says, oh, you've been diagnosed with Bicardi. And I know from Omen that that has these features. And so if you're looking for this feature, I'm going to give you the people who have Bicardi as well. Things like that. Steve, um, I, let me know what I missed. Yeah, I think, no, I mean, I, I think one of the issues will be uh, for many of the consortia, there are common players. So, you know, if, if you, and I'm coming at it from the NHLBI and IDDK, as well as the NHGRI side of things. So you, you basically have the same groups of people in multiple data sets contributing. And I think one of the great advantages that might be available through Anvil is sorting through that. So, you know, you don't get the same person represented six times in a data set that you think you're using as a control. Uh, you know, it's for, because they're from the same study that's contributing to both consortia. Uh, I think the other issue that is obvious is that uh, diagnostic characteristics are difficult for a number of these diseases and phenotypes that we're interested in. And if there's a way of really uh, automating that process, that would be great. So I think there's going to be use there, but it's going to be a lot of training as well. I'd like to speak to the question raised that how to make data sets findable. Uh, well, our experience with the XRNA Atlas is to make the data fair, uh, which means register APIs using open API with fairsharing.org. And unbeknownst to us, Google Dataset Search indexed it, all the metadata. So individual data sets are actually findable using Google Dataset Search. So I would say Anvil would do well to actually make their data sets fair. And in that way, <clears throat> they can make it findable, not just within Anvil, but across other NIH uh, efforts and also globally. 
Anthony, I saw you went off mute. I wasn't sure if you're going to comment. Oh, sorry. I have actually been off mute, but uh, maybe I should go on mute, actually. <laughs> no worries. So let me just put on a couple of threads that Elizabeth pulled on uh, just to distinguish them for additional comment as, and we could potentially, and, and it's natural to shift into the opportunities landscape as you're talking about strengths. Um, you know, as at least when I think about, you know, the, the consortial life cycle, right, at least right now, um, you know, as hopefully more and more consortia use the Anvil as its data coordinating center platform. But in reality, there's always going to be a mix of this process. But in that setting, you know, a key incentive is to actually empower the consortia, consortia's own capacity to advance discovery, right, which I think is what Elizabeth pointed to across other data sets. By definition, that means that it's, it's going to be an exponential curve, right? It'll, it'll start out slow because initially there's going to be a smaller number of data sets that are relevant to you. Uh, but as you enhance the number of data sets that are cross queryable with your disease of interest, presumably there'll be a feed forward loop of, of interaction. But I wanted to also pull on the second thread, which is a little bit of a different use case, at least in my mind, Elizabeth, which is, you know, within the consortia setting uh, or even outside of it, the notion of even a, a single file or a single, you know, uh, uh, patient being interpreted in the context of a canvas, really. So, and this really, you know, sort of broaches this uh, clinical use cross-cutting theme that Valentina pointed to. Um, and I'd love to hear, you know, both the current strengths that are, are people or, or possibilities that people think exist, and and what are the real opportunities, and what would it take to empower such efforts on behalf of. I think, Elizabeth, if you're pointing to some real-time diagnostics or interpretation of cases in a meaningful way, um, leveraging these resources. I'd love for somebody else to chime in, um, but I don't know. I feel like this thing that I'm talking about is really useful for like rare disorders. I don't know how helpful that would be in a... I'm working on type two diabetes, for example, but it would kind of help for things like, I know that if you've got type two diabetes, you might also be interested in blood sugar measures or whatever. So I think it's worth investing in and it would be useful to larger groups, but it will be particularly helpful for that, those kinds of projects. Right. So I, I'd be interested to know how Anvil is going to deal with uh, data addiction, especially for diseases and how they're going to try and share the standards that other NIH um, programs are doing. So I've been working with the All of Us program and the research workbench. And I think one of the opportunities and potential strengths would be if there's a harmonization of the way that clinical data um, can be presented in these workbenches, because then you're not going to have to keep on relearning a whole new process for dealing with data. Um, when you're trying to, say, find uh, patients with certain phenotypes. So I think that's maybe an opportunity as well as a potential strength if Anvil can work with some of these other um, data sets that NIH is currently pushing for. Yeah, I, th I think it's a great point. And, and actually, what you, you're, you're, perfect, you're following the perfect SWOT analysis, right? You're sort of identifying current weaknesses is often a lack of these types of phenotypic Harmonization. I think you've gotten very good, and Anvil is exceptional at the genotype harmonization effort. Um, but in order to fully empower that, you have to convert that extant weakness of non-searchable phenotyping um, to a opportunity or a strength. I, th I think it's really key, especially in the rare disease. And you know, what to your point, Elizabeth, about the rare disease. You know, I actually think that um, you know one of the themes of precision medicine is that you know every human is rare. Um, if you collect enough information about that human um, and make it searchable. So what are other potential weaknesses? And here you can think about from a weakness. Oh, actually, David, you have your hand up before I move forward. Sorry about that. Yeah, I was just going to say that we're, we're sort of dealing with that in, in CSER. Um, CSER is a little bit of a different animal. I, I'd say that we... We started right at the beginning when CISA was starting. And so we're, we actually have a data coordinating center for the phenotype data. So we do have a chance to come up with that. So actually the, the, the PIs are meeting to decide how exactly we're going to do that um, before uh, depositing that into the Anvil. 
Right. And, and even for you, even upon depositing, how, how do we ensure that whatever you guys decided, right, aligns with whatever is existing in the end? Well, that chain of propagation is still, sounds like it, a challenge regardless. It is, it, and that's still being negotiated. Um, right. But, but we, we have other researchers that are in all of us and so forth, and so we, it, it is a bit uh, cross-pollinated. Mm -hmm. So I've got one potential weakness, and that is sort of, I think people getting into using Gamble is going to be one of the biggest challenges. Um, getting the message out that there is this platform trying to really encourage people to use the platform. I don't really have a great opportunity suggestion for that, but I know that's something that, I mean, I've heard about Anvil, Mike Schatz has spoken about it a few times on the G GDSN network, but the energy required to start using something like that compared with when you're just focused on small projects is kind of quite high. So I think that's going to be somewhere where maybe smarter people than myself may think of ways to ease the entropy required to start using these shared programs and processes. Um, also having ways where one can have a free fiddle, basically see what it can do, give it a test drive, get an idea of, how much it would cost to use a platform like that before you actually really get into using it for something serious. Because the big thing that puts me off of cloud computing is the lack of understanding how much it's going to cost up front. Right. So let me pull up, let me just pull a couple of threads and I'll turn it over um, to Manoli. Is that you know you essentially identified a threat uh, to the success of the program, which is cost. Um, you know, as compared to what are typically university subsidized resources um, in ways that investigators don't have to think about, although the NIH does. Um, but most investors don't care that the NIH has to think about it. Uh, so that's you know, the threat uh, context. Um, and then you, you mentioned uh, the barrier to entry also being, you know, sort of having to learn to do something different than what you already know. Um, and so again, in a SWOT analysis, typically you, you either want to mitigate threats or weaknesses uh, or convert them into opportunities of strengths uh, in some setting. And I'll turn it over to Manoli because uh, you had your hand up and, and then David. I, uh, I wanted to follow up on that comment because I, I really feel that comment in the sense that I don't use Anvil right now. I use a lot of dbGaP data and it, the process is just so difficult to go through to find data sets that are appropriate for what I do. And so what I do is pharmacogenomics, which is even more complex because you're looking at disease and drug um, many times, which are not available in these data sets. But uh, I wanted to say one of the ways maybe to turn this into an opportunity, and it would, and I say it because I think it would be helpful for me just to understand, is to show for people who want to be engaged in this, such as my own self and the consortia we have, is to show how you could use it in a very concrete manner, right? Like um, in a very easy manner of even just identifying the data sets for those very specific um, uh, phenotype. And in, in my case, the phenotype is, is really specific when you have drug disease. Great point, David. Yeah, I just kind of want to talk a little bit about the costing and, and that within CSER, uh, the coordinating center was actually funded uh, to fund all the sites. So I'm not only worried about my site, I'm worried about all the other sites. So we we have a, a, a student uh, that's working on a uh, sort of a pipeline to to surveillance uh, or, or keep an eye on what's going on, what's 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 happening. So I would say if that was a bit more automated and we'll be glad to share the code if we if we uh, come up with something clever, um, but that that's something it just at least for me coming out of uh, our budget. Yeah, I think these are great points, and, and cost is uh, cost consideration is not Anvil specific. It's it's broadly an issue across the cloud based implementation. Um, a couple of, of threads that at least we found, and if, if others have comments on this, you know the engagement of of, of the cloud. To your, I think not only uh, you pointed to this one is is cost transparency and planning around those resources. But then second, uh, even if you give people money, there's the barrier to entry of like, do I really need to invest effort in doing something different than what I'm already doing? Um, and that opportunity landscape of either in increasing the speed or the scientific capacity, right, is the communication opportunity. And what we found is that some people feel that they can do something much faster um, than 
they can do otherwise um, or have access, um, maybe even searchable in the way that uh, you mentioned, Manoli, um, to something that they couldn't have otherwise. Those are two drivers that then mitigate the risk that they feel around cost and might even engage them in experimentation uh, on behalf of that process. So even experimenting with costs is, I think, a valuable opportunity in a front investigators. They'll have to get a sense of that as, as you highlighted, David. Manoli? Oh, you might have had your hand up. Okay, uh, Stephen? Yeah, just, just one point uh, related to cost is that I've been involved with Biodata Catalyst as well. And one of the things that happened there is that NHLBI provided Biodata Catalyst fellowships for people to get involved uh, and provided the first year uh, funding. But a lot of the time spent in getting people up and, and using Biodata Catalyst meant that after about six months, they were ready to actually start working. And of course their project can take a year or more and so it became a cost continuum, you know, to make certain that it takes, you know, six months of, of work uh, just to figure out what to do, another six months to get started, and they're just getting going on, on the analysis. So I think it's important to think through this cost structure so you don't just get people started and at middle of a project or beginning of a project, you say, oh, now you have to come up with the funds to continue. Uh, and, and so I think it's important to make a commitment uh, because it's an ethical commitment as much as it is a cost commitment. I think that's a great point. And I think it's distinguishable from, you know, I, I, I labeled cost as a threat, but sustainability as associated to cost is a, is a second threat. Even if you have enough funds to do X, the overhead you might get for engaging that and then having to leave the platform or go elsewhere and the downstream harm you might engage as an investigator or consortia is a second threat essentially. So, uh, and I think that sustainable- yeah, And, and I've, I've tried to ask, I've, I've asked the Biodata Catalyst folks and NHLBI leadership, well, what's going to happen after the next couple of years? And they said, well, we're trying to figure that out. It's right. not necessarily a great answer. Right. I'd like to bring up, uh, you know, switch gears a bit. If, Please. Uh, is it okay? Yeah. Um, and bring up the topic of, you know, the changing landscape of uh, data intensive research. Now, certainly cloud has changed the landscape and Anvil is a step in that direction, you know, of changing how we operate, how consortia operate. Um, I would say the weakness is that the roles are now not clearly articulated. You know, what will be the role of Anvil? It should define what it is and in what kind of ways it will interact with Nzoshi in the future in this change landscape where Anvil can take much of the role of data coordination. Uh, also, uh, we are in the world of competition, right? So we compete for NAGI funding, then we get funded, then we collaborate, and then we compete again. How does that new resource affect that process? You know, do we need all to be, you know, collaborators of Anvil to get funding? Or uh, if you're not members of the institutions that are part of Anvil, do we have a chance of getting funded for consortia? Uh, I think it will, if it was a kind of commercial service organization providing Anvil services, it will be easier, but Anvil is an academic institution and infrastructure is the Broad Institute. You know, <laughs> do we all become part of the Broad Institute? You know, how do we compete with somebody with the, from the Broad Institute? Can we? You know, I am not sure about that anymore. So defining clearly uh, the parameters of competition in this new environment is very important actually for the community's buy-in, I would say and maybe some kind of uniform letters of collaboration, standards of sharing technical data, agreeing to collaborate with whoever is granted in a competitive uh, grant review process. These are all new questions and unless addressed, actually they'll create a major uh, weakness of the whole project. The whole community may silently turn against it. And that's a, that's a weakness and a threat, I would say. Yeah. Before I engage that, is, is, it, is the next comment that I think I see another hand up? Uh, is that related to this? Or, or no? Nope, you're on mute. 
Mm -hmm. are, are we at, which section are we at? Opportunities, threats? We, we have... So I think we, we went through uh, uh, strengths and then some weaknesses. I think we're, we're not exactly fo following the opportunities. I think we're really talking about a couple of threats that can be converted into opportunities or strengths, um, which I think is fine. Uh, so, you know, what Alex has highlighted is that, you know, a real threat um, are narratives of ownership, governance, and as they intersect with competitive practices in many ways, the Anvil as a resource is poised to enhance the, com the competitive success of investigators who adopt that environment, right? It increases access, speed, um, processes. So the, the better user you are of the cloud, potentially as a competitive practice, it actually does two things. One, accelerates the scientific process and it engages competition outside of simply resource limitation or access limitation, which have historically been barriers to competition, right? You can't access the data or you can't do it as fast. Those have been essentially variables of competition. And essentially we're making the field equal in some respects, but to your point, um, you know, I think one of the really exciting things about the Anvil and many other programs is this intersection between NIH and academia and even commercial entities in developing the overall ecosystem and your narrative and the risk you are suggesting, right, is that unless we have that narrative clear, those could be barriers to entry, uh, but also an opportunity if we can drive that narrative clear, assuage fears as part of the engagement process. If I read it between the line, Alex. Um, not exactly. You know, I was Please. mostly uh, speaking from my perspective, yeah. uh, playing a <laughs> data coordination role sure. in Kentucky, oh, correct. right? Correct. This is the role that's basically going away, at least to some degree, I would say. And that's justifiable. I think it's a change in technologies. And right. certainly, you know, it's justifiable that if something can be done more economically, uh, less redundantly, a lot of resource, uh, reuse of resources, that's completely justifiable. What I'm saying is that this new role of Anvil needs to be um, understood also as changing the dynamics of competition. And the question is, do we want competition or do we want just one huge collaboration? Yeah. You know, my sense is that we, there is, the talk is all, we, we all collaborate we all work together, right? But the reality is we also compete. So if, if that step is uh, eliminated, mm -hmm. what will happen is only those that are part of Anvil or part of the institution, the Broad Institute, et cetera, they're the only ones who get the funding for this consortium. And I'm not sure that's the intention mm -hmm. of the funding agency. So the question is how to manage that transition where some of the role of the consortium, say data coordination, is taken up by uh, Anvil, while at the same time keeping the level playing field when it comes to the competitive step, right? So that the institutions that participate are not privileged during the competition, yeah. that information about Anvil is shared so that different institutions can develop competitive proposals. And also post-competition that if they get funded, they can participate, you know, in maybe contributing to Anvil activities yeah. and so on. So I would say it's a complex issue. Yeah, no, I, I think actually you pulled up a friend that I hadn't uh, prioritized, right? You know, we we're talking about consortia membership, the scientific process itself, but you're pointing at the, a separate comp competitive landscape of what is the DCC comp competitive landscape? Um, and what is the role of these platforms in some respect? Like how can you compete as a DCC, for example? And, and should there be a DCC? Yeah. Yeah. And the answer may be that there is no DCC that, you know, that consortia should propose that and will be the DCC. In that I, case, in yeah. that case, everybody, sh uh, then and will, for example, would need to agree to be the DCC for every consortium, right? I, I wonder, uh, not privilege this consortium or that consortium. Is, I wonder if Anthony, if you could comment on this, or um, I, I see David frowning, but maybe I'm not <laughs> frowning uh, regarding this topic, but uh, maybe Anthony, you can comment. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, it's a really important conversation. I don't see DCCs going away, um, honestly. I think that they play uh, just the same important role now that they did before. As I mentioned, even these new consortia like Primed or Emerge, that um, have launched since the Anvil began. I'm, we have great interactions with the DCCs and work very uh, collaboratively with them. 
And I think what happens is it's a collaboration where the DCC knows the data sets better than we will. You know, there's that certain side of um, these three genomes are blacklisted because I know they were done by this tech on this day. And that's something that consor the consortium knows and would be very hard for us to get visibility into. And then there's a manner of kind of propagating that information to us. So I, at least from my perspective, I don't see DCCs going away. And I, and I think it's a great opportunity to engage an ecosystem of participants in the ANVIL. And you know, one thing I would appreciate input from this group, my approach to this is whenever asked for a letter of support, I unequivocally say yes, even, you know, even in cases where it's you know, competing with someone from my institute, I always write a letter of support as, as, part, as an ANVIL PI when asked, um, and I've never said no to anyone. That's great to hear. Uh, I would say that's really, uh, I had a different experience with some other platform providers in academia who withdrew their life of support after deciding to compete with me. So anyway, uh, I don't want to name names here, but uh, another aspect of it is openness to technical information, right? So sharing enough technical information with these consortia so they can plug in into Anvil in an informed way so their applications are as competitive as others. So that, that will be helpful too. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I see if the car has his hand raised. Hey, go, ahead, car, go ahead. Yeah, hi. I mean, this is probably just a broadly philosophical comment and you're all aware of it, but I mean, I think this is more in the opportunity realm and uh, the opportunity for Anvil to perhaps level the playing field a bit. Uh, what is happening in this world is an enormous amount of data being produced. And as a result, there's competition for data analysts and data scientists and experts. And most of them, many of them, are not always in the biomedical arena because they go to the tech companies on the East and West Coast. And so what is happening, what is emerging is a, a disparity, not only I would say racial, but also geographic, in that many of these, this ex, much of this expertise is residing in academic citadels. And there's an opportunity for Anvil to help kind of level the field there by you know, doing your road shows, doing your MOOCs, doing your courses, and making Anvil um, something that is reachable, accessible to not just the data scientist, but the clinician investigator and the student. And I think that's a tremendous role that Anvil can play, because I think that this gap is widening. Even you know, if you compare Midwest with the East and West Coast, we have a hard time recruiting data scientists and exp experts. And, and I think if we had tools like Anvil that are you know, accessible and and uh, kind of level the playing field. I think that would be a huge opportunity for for this program. Yeah. Again, I think Anthony, you probably are shaking your head inside and out uh, regarding <laughs> that opportunity uh, landscape. Uh, and, and I think we, we see this ubiquitously uh, in, in this setting. Um, I, I wonder, you know, and, and maybe this, this is a form of opportunity, which Alex also, I think you were bringing up, you know, around the technical sharing, but, you know, may, maybe pushing on that um, DCC landscape, you know, what we see also is emerging, and, and I think Brian touched on this, is, um, is that interop is another version of democratizing the DCC landscape, meaning endless capacity to interoperate with other environments and resources um, is an, an expanding that interop landscape and in which I think the NCI and, and especially NHGRI has been leading um, will continue to essentially create opportunities uh, for additional platform development and resources that can interoperate to connect um, moving forward. I, I'm not sure if that's a shared, a shared view, but I think that's another way to mitigate that risk of you know, the, the monolith sort of setting that I, I think you're, you're pointing to. I agree, interoperability, right? Uh, API-centric, for example, mm -hmm. standard data models, you know, fairness, right? Mm -hmm. 
And just to be uh, fair to David, David wasn't frowning for any other purpose except light reasons, apparently, which is... I'll try to smile more. <laughs> <laughs> right. So let, let's, we have, a, I think, a few more minutes. Um, what else can we pull on as a threads of either weaknesses or threats that, you know, either we need to mitigate or convert into strengths and opportunities? Uh, and then again, this can be either sort of from a cloud centric perspective or anvil specific uh, in a setting. Yeah, so one, um, I mean, a threat, I don't know, yeah, threat would be that you have an investigator who has, let's say, a particular domain of biology or medicine that they're interested in, and they would like these um, to be more interoperable. And I think Stephen alluded to this for example, how well can they in a GRI work with other institutions, uh, NIH institutes rather, to um, have either a conduit between Anvil and their uh, cloud or actually assimilate those data sets onto Anvil so that I don't have to go hopping from cloud to cloud. I could just uh, potentially, uh, if NIGRI was able to have these exist, um, build these bridges, I would just plan stay at Anvil and not have to go elsewhere. I think that that's a great point, and it is a, a very clear threat. Uh, is these the still challenging context of the cloud to cloud context in ways that it sort of broach on Anthony's earlier comments about the need, the need to copy or where do you create copies, and uh, is that the current solution? Um, you know, across the the intercloud context. Titus. I, did, I did want to point out, though, that the work of NCPI, you know, has has shown, has underscored the importance of what you're saying here, too, right? The mm -hmm. fact that at least within those organizations, those platforms between BDCAT and CRDC and Kids First and Anvil, we can share and we can leverage in Anvil. I can pull uh, and use data um, from all four of those. I, I think the bigger question for me is how do we replicate that across all of the NIH and beyond? Um, and that's where you start running into the issues about, you know, cross region sort of work and cross cloud uh, work that's more important to, um, uh, it's gonna be something that we need to look at um, in the future. But I, I'm, I'm happy to see the progress that we've been making there. I think it's really exciting. Okay. Titus? Well, Brian more or less took half of what I was gonna say and said it. So I'm just gonna <laughs> say, um, you know, I, I think a major threat is if there's only one set of backend systems that is capable of interoperating, in which case it's not really interoperability. And I think I think NCPI is a partial solution, but that's an example of um, what Cory Doctorow called indifferent, uh, sorry, cooperative interoperability. We're all going to get in a room and we're going to talk and make sure our systems work together. Um, uh, but I think there's also a, a strong future role for what Cory calls uh, indifferent interoperability. I don't care that you're interoperating with me because it all just works. And, and I would like to see, I think that in the next five years, that's what I want, sort of want to see. Like, I don't have to talk to any, I don't have to talk to Brian ever, no, no offense, Brian, but you know, to use your systems, it just all works. And, and if it doesn't, there's a help desk and, and, and standard channels. Um, and uh, I think that speaks to a lot of the stuff that's been brought up about, you know, that Alex brought up about funding and so on, as well as some of the other things. But so I just want to make sure it was really noted. I think it's an awesome vision, uh, Titus. We all seek not to care, essentially. David. Uh, just just want to quickly say, uh, I see an opportunity. I know we're just focusing on, on, on ingestion here, but seeing that transition over, and I know this is what everyone wants here, but that transition over to tools development and analyses would be uh, uh, a super um, great opportunity for this group. And uh, I, I know CSER's sort of in that role right now. And uh, yeah, uh, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, and, and I think that's a terrific opportunity, you know, and I think it's again, an, another area that the interop context uh, begins to broach, um, making, essentially ensuring that tool development is interoperable, you know, and not necessarily required within a particular setting uh, is, is a key opportunity. I know some of you, um, you know, uh, were essentially appointed discussants um, uh, by by an age. Uh, any of the other discussants who haven't um, commented, who who wanted to add? Uh, 
Uh, I always worry about hogging airtime. Okay, I was taught to, to count to seven and then start talking again. Um, so, um, you know, the, the title here was really sub, you know, the submission process. And, and uh, at least one of the things that I, I think is interesting is maybe that's actually not the right pairing, thinking about submission and consortia, right? Because it, it invokes, a, a, again, a, a data life cycle and process that we're at, potentially are trying to, to undermine, right? That it's not, you know, what I, at least I heard is that, you know, some of the opportunities is to transition the Anvil from being seen as a submission site as to a platform for discovery, use, support of the data coordinating centers roles in ways that are fair, transparent, non-competitive, interoperable. Um, and that submission is really an act of use, not necessarily on behalf of fulfilling the NIH's requirement for data sharing uh, in some respects. Uh, I mean, those are gonna be existent, right? But um, dbGaP can also do that uh, to some extent to fulfill those roles. Um, and so I think, you know, that's a, that's a real opportunity is to really think about that context. Let me, let me just push on, on the consortia part, but again, coming back to the clinical use, um, you know, I, I think this is an area where the, the ANVIL is really thinking um, to innovate. And uh, somebody mentioned CLIA, for example, earlier. Um, what are the threats or challenges in the context of clinical use um, if we really want to move this forward, uh, if, if folks can, can chime in on that? I, had, I actually had a question, which maybe if I knew the answer to would help, um, which was when they were showing about the clinical genomics aspects, there were two parts that kind of struck me and I realized it was probably cut for time. One was, was any of that curation process actually curated with kind of the SOPs we use in ClinGen for curation for ClinVar? And it doesn't have to be like expert panel working group, but it, it could be actually leveraging some of those same processes. So you're getting a better quality of annotation. Um, and then the other was, I just had no idea how those areas were chosen. Social determinants of health is really important, but without a champion or a use case, not so much. And so it, it, I, did, I didn't get a good feel for that. And I realized this is probably just a time issue. So I, I put my notes in, this is Shannon, I put my notes in the doc, but um, this is an area that's really critical to me. And so it, I unfortunately maybe just it's its own session, another time, another workshop, but I, did, I didn't get a good takeaway. Okay. I do definitely agree that it could have its own session um, in some respects um, and does point, you know, to this notion of clinical use. Uh, let me throw out just a couple of points to see if they, if they spark something last couple of minutes. You know, whenever you say the word clinical, most institutions, hospital systems, you know, like shutter, all the, all the doors closed and, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's very challenging for most institutions to think about a a collaborative cloud environment as a clinical use environment. Those typically don't go together in the same sentence for most institutions. Um, I wonder if that's m just my own experience. Uh, I suspect not, but um, it, it clearly is it's the case a, that most institutions a, don't have local capacity to leverage everything that the Anvil might have on behalf of clinical use locally, um, right? And so that's the, op the opportunity gap. And sorry, Valentina, go ahead. Didn't say anything. Okay, sorry. Somebody else did. Okay. Yeah. It was me, Adam. I'm sorry. I, I was just going to comment to your, you, you struck a point when you said that it's trust. So, so clinical site, I'm in an academic hospital. We have sure. no problem with sharing if we trust the entity. And, and that's a relationship building thing, right? And, and I guess my point is this is not unheard of. You know, ClinVar, ClinGen sit right in the middle. Because I'm on these calls, these are our CLIA lab is heavily involved in that curation. I sit on an expert panel. So it's right at the heart of it. So it is possible. It's not like they're afraid of it, but it has to be trusted and it has to be done right. And I just think we, from the research side, from the pure research side, we tend to think of it as an afterthought. And that's what I think is that missed opportunity. All right. Stephen. Yeah, I, I think one of the questions that will come up is what populates ANVIL? Uh, and 
the most likely data that will populate ANVIL will be those that were from ongoing consortia, and those consortia are composed of studies, whether they're longitudinal cohort studies or other studies that typically are for research use only and actually have consents that will not return information to participants. So, you know, that side of things, I think, will be uh, not necessarily CLIA, but you use that information to motivate uh, the CLIA appropriateness and, and actually, you know, if there are things that can be then taken back to participants, uh, if there is like a specific act actionability, then I think that may happen. But I, I see the initial widespread use is more discovery of things that then could be utilized by the appropriate uh, studies that have CLIA interests. Yeah, that makes sense. It's a car. Oh, you're on mute still. I, I would, I mean, I think I'm not sure. I wasn't coming into this meeting that thinking that if we talk about clinical application, that, that's an enormous challenge. Uh, but uh, one issue would be that um, institutions are going to regard data as currency. And so there'll be competition in the future, which is not based on how many MRIs you have, but how much data you have. So that's going to be probably a factor when you're thinking about collaborating with institutions. But if you're thinking about participant level uh, collaboration, that's a very, very interesting domain, but I'm not sure whether that's on Anvil's you know, radar you know, in terms of potentially, for example, individuals contributing the genomic data for research and potentially even for monetization. But I think that's very, kind of going in a very different direction here. Yeah, let me just pull on that thread a bit. You know, obviously Danville and, and many of these platforms began with genomics. And what we're seeing is, right, that the, the data generation around genomics is moving into the clinical domain in ways that puts those data sets under purview of the hospital ecosystem, less under the research ecosystem in, in some respects. So it used to be sort of clinical data versus research whole genome sequencing efforts uh, is shifting so that large scale big data are beginning to be generated at the clinical interface, which drives a, a different governance and decision-making process um, as opposed to the cohort-based sample characterization efforts that um, currently exist. I don't know, Anthony, if, if you, in your efforts to engage sort of this clinical domain, maybe you could comment. Yeah, I, you know, I, I said this at the beginning, I'm a physician by training, so this is an area that I care very, very deeply about. I think a lot of, um, one of the things that was quite successful in the first three years of the ANVIL was the AHA led a scoping project around what are common use cases. And two areas that emerged where we felt ANVIL could, apply, could provide early wins for the clinical community was in supplying breast practices pipelines for use by medical centers. Um, so for example, when you think about polygenic risk scores, that's a new approach to, a new risk factor that a lot of hospitals want to start implementing. And so by providing a best practices pipeline to compute them and do all the imputation work, it removes the need for the hospital to have expertise in how to compute that pipeline. Similarly, the implementation of Seeker uh, as a tool for making, helping uh, genetic counselors and genetic professionals make uh, diagnoses in the setting of rare diseases. Uh, we also view that as being a nice clinical win. So I think a lot of the, the work so far has really focused on providing tooling to medical centers to make clinical um, you know, diagnostics uh, more widely available. But where I think it would be really great to go in the future is thinking more creatively about aspects for um, how to conduct clinical research studies through the ANVIL. For example, you think about something like REDCap, which is so widely utilized and made by our very good friends and collaborators at Vanderbilt. I think it would be a real win to be able to have a much tighter integration between REDCap and ANVIL so that as REDCap studies are run, that data seamlessly ends up landing in the ANVIL where researchers can use it. Um, that's one example among many where I'd like to see us go, but again, it's still, um, we're only three years into this. Yeah. Maybe it gives, it gives you a thumbs up, and uh, I think a great use case. You know, the, the clinical trial, even if observational, the CRF to workspace environment transition, these are still key challenges. Hundred percent agree. One minute and forty-two seconds left. Um, let me open up 
more broadly across the SWAT landscape of either strengths, opportunities, weaknesses, or threats that, that may not have been addressed that come to mind? And I'll leave. Um, I just have one that I guess I always say because of the um, population I work with is that uh, I think there needs, I, I don't know what efforts are in place to ensure diversity um, in, in ANVIL. And I know that there are lots of diverse studies getting put in, and that's not what I mean. Um, I mean, it, we still continue to have a Eurocentric um, databases, even with pushes for uh, diversity. So uh, what engagement are you doing with people from cons using in consortia that are dedicated to these diverse populations? Right. So here you're pointing at that diversity in the data, not necessarily the, the users or um, researchers. Okay. Anthony, any, any comments around this? Um, yeah. So I, I don't know that we yet have any input into that process in terms of we're not, we don't design the studies that are being run. Um, you know, certainly Primed is a great example of a consortium that is focused on increasing our diversity, especially for polygenic risk scores. Um, and I certainly would love to see us play a bigger role in helping to make sure that studies are designed to make sure that our diversity is increased. But at least right now, it's not an area where we have any purview over that I'm aware of anyways. Anthony, this is Emer. I could also comment, um, at least in CSER, we're working closely with Anvil to put in place some of the tools that you need to analyze diverse populations. Uh, so uh, some of the tools include tools that infer genetic ancestry, and you often need to encompass that in the types of approaches that you use. Um, so, and certainly I would also mention that the CSER data um, is uh, uh, the CSER in general is a consortium with a mandate to recruit 65% or above uh, participants who meet the definition of um, underrepresented and diverse for NHGRI. Perfect. Uh, Adam, um, sorry, I need to interrupt this discussion, oh, but yeah, I, I, we're running out of time. Are you ready for the presentation?